So we lost power in my house um, in Lynn on Wednesday night in the wee hours, and then it didn't come back on, and it didn't come back on. And, um, you know, and then, so we had Thursday night in the dark, and then it didn't come on Friday morning. And I was um, at first kind of, you know, fine with my Laura Ingalls Wilder lifestyle, um, just taking things out of the fridge and taking things, you know, that would get yucky in the um, washing machine out so we didn't get mold and that kind of thing. And it occurred to me as I was starting to get fidgety and really irritated by the lack of electricity that there are people in Puerto Rico, you know, who didn't have power, who still might not have power, who didn't have power for months and months and months under really terrible circumstances. I had clean water. I could just, you know, I figured I'd really start to get wimpy when I ran out of hot water. But I had clean water and I could also just hop in the car come here, have electricity, plug in my Wi-Fi if I wanted to. So I was sort of playing at this inconvenience. It was also really pleasant outside, and the house was fairly warm, and it was all fine. Although my neighbors said they were a little bit freaked out because they said, you know, we have not had a power outage. You know, so they were saying, like, I've lived here 30 years. I've lived here 23 years. We've never lost power. And I said to one of them jokingly, but I kind of meant it, I said, we'll get used to it. With climate change and these three big, you know, powerful storms and such, this one, this windstorm wasn't even really predicted. I only knew it was coming because I was on Twitter and Dave Epstein, the uh, meteorologist, tweeted, it's going to be a big wind, so you better charge your phones. And I did, I charged my phone and that was very helpful. I said to my neighbor at the same time, I said, you know, I have no useful skills, so I'm the first one you should drug up and throw to the zombies <laughs> in the event of the zombie apocalypse. You know, like I have nothing to offer. I, you know, I can't chop wood or carry very much water or do much of th that kind of thing. One of the things that occurred to me, and again, this is really what we're here to talk about, is faith in a time of climate change. And faith doesn't mean optimism. It just means faithfulness, which is to do those things that keep you going one step at a time in the assurance that it's all still meaningful. It's all still precious. And for as long as we can and as long as we shall, we will love this world. We will delight in its beauties. We will be grateful as far as we can remember to be grateful for every beautiful day that we're given for the fresh water that we have and to cultivate uh, reverence and energy and strength soul strength among ourselves so that we can show up when things are rough for the fires or for the hard winds or for the flooding so that we can be deployed as soldiers of love if you will for places of crisis, um, because they're, they're going to be part of what is part of our lives um, for the foreseeable future. One of the things that occurred to me was, oh my gosh, you know what I should have done is I should have come to church, made sure the doors are unlocked, set out 25 chargers of all kinds, and, and sent out the word and put up some coffee and put out some you know cookies or something, or order pizza and say, everybody who doesn't have power, or even if you just want to hang out, come here, charge up, do some work together, hang out. So I want you to envision with me um, what that would look like and if you can be part of that. Because like I myself at that time didn't have electricity, so I was a little put out too. But it would be wonderful if we could become first responders, a first responding congregation in that way. Again, we're not going in and putting wires back up on, you know, wherever they put them. <laughs> you see how much useful knowledge I have. Um, I, I'm, but I, I, I was really good at going out and greeting the trucks that arrived from Syracuse, because National Grid sent um, workers all the way from Syracuse. They were coming from all over. And I was really good at going out to the trucks and saying, hi, we're so glad you're here. Do you need something? You need a cup of coffee or a water? Um, they said, no, thanks, but hey, lady, this must be a nice neighborhood because someone gave us Fiji water. <laughs> and I was like, really? That's, I'm, I'm very surprised. 
I want to, um, so I'm putting that out to you. I will be on sabbatical for six months, but this isn't going to be over in six months. I would like us to remember what a beautiful resource we have here in this beautiful place and how much um, in a blizzard or in a time of uh, high winds or flooding, this can be a high ground in more ways than one. I want to share with you the work of Margaret Bullitt Jonas because she inspires me a lot. And she is actually an uh, environmental activist, but she's also an Episcopal priest. And so uh, Margaret Bullitt Jonas speaks beautifully in a way that really I, uh, you know, I rely on her words to the hard work that we have to do in our current reality and also to the congregational work that we can do. And the heart work, um, and this comes from one of her, her presentations that I attended. Well, I attended one such presentation, but this was called Climate Change, Extreme Weather, and Vulnerability, an Interfaith Summit on How to Respond. And that, that word vulnerability is really important. Um, but, she, but she talks about the spiritual resources, the spiritual resources that we need as we're called to, as she says, stabilize the climate and reweave the web of life, which is such a beautiful way to put it, restabilize the climate or stabilize the climate. She says that we really need to be resilient and take care of our inner lives, as was we just heard in our, our reading. What are we going to do with all of those feelings of fear, and anxiety, and I think especially for people who have little tiny ones in their lives and maybe grandchildren on the way, where do we find that strength? Where is our, our core um, and our source so that we don't fall into depression and despair and total panic and giving up and that kind of nihilism and cynicism that can be so appealing or that kind of I'm not going to listen anymore. She co-edited a book called Rooted and Rising, Voices of Courage in Time of Climate Crisis, which is a collection of essays that I recommended that the Green Sanctuary team take a look at. Uh, but she has a three-part suggestion for how we orient our hearts. And again, we start with the heart, because if our hearts are not present and open, everything else that we do, all, of, all the other kinds of ways that we act and care, aren't grounded in something that, that can sustain us and that can last. And also, while we have this three-part three, uh, framework for the heart, it's something, again, we are teaching and modeling for our children. So she talks about the first step is to begin with an awakened heart. And that is, I guess I would say, someone who is alive and present to reality, but also really present to the, the love that really is um, constantly revealing itself in the world. And we have to look for it. It's, a, it's someone who's learning to see the world through the eyes of compassion instead of contempt, disgust, weariness. And we discover as we awaken that, that loving heart that we also are loved and we also are cherished, just as you know, Francine is doing all this work on behalf of baby elephants. She's, there's a whole team, international team of people working to see to it that 37 baby elephants don't become imprisoned in horrible conditions. Do you believe yourself to be as worthy of love and care as a baby elephant? Because you are. Even if you don't experience it that directly with a team of people working you know, for you, that's part of having the awakened heart is to realize that there is a force of love active in the world and that you're plugged into it if you want to be. 
Here is a, a rendition of a prayer poem composed by Francis of Assisi. Such love does the sky now pour that whenever I stand in a field, I have to ring out the light when I get home. So that's the awakened heart realizing, oh God, yes, there is so much that disturbs me, but there is also this other reality. And again, I don't say this with a Pollyanna point of view. I say it as someone who struggles myself to not give in to the cynicism or the anger or the sense of growling disgust I have for human behavior and recklessness and destructiveness and evil. Margaret Bullock Jonas says, the only way forward is not to feed the voice of self-hatred, but to listen to the voice of love that is always sounding in our hearts and that alone can help us imagine new possibilities, turn us around and guide us on a different path. And the next path, part of the path of the heart is the broken heart. I'm sorry to say, but I'm also glad to say. This is the part of spiritual work that can be most difficult and frightening for Westerners and particularly for Americans because we have this relentless optimism thing that we're supposed to subscribe to. You know, if you, if you talk to most people, their message is always gonna be, you know, but I'm gonna get better, or I'm gonna like improve my running speed, or I'm gonna lose 10 pounds, or I'm gonna like do this thing harder so that I can be better. And when I get there, I'm gonna be happy. And it, I, don't, I don't really know if that's, does that work? You know, does it work in a lasting way or is it perhaps um, a more a sustainable, because again, we're in ecology, is it a more sustainable path to say, look, the, the awakened heart is the broken heart too. And that's part of the experience of being alive because we are mortal. As the story that the children told earlier reminds us, we don't get to see the olives come out on the trees that we plant. It's poignant as hell and it's real. We're not, no one is exempt from it. And so being able to rest in the broken heart doesn't mean that you're morbid and that you're uh, clinically depressed. It, although being clinically depressed is part of what can happen for any of us at any point in our heart journey. Um, it just means that we are in touch with our grief. We have to be in touch with our grief because what are you doing? What am I doing to myself? and to those I love and am called to love when I repress that grief? What am I doing when I don't want to look at it or I don't want to feel it and I won't go into that broken-hearted place? I'm shopping, I'm gambling, not me personally, you know, everybody has to own our own, you know, uh, distractions and addictions. We're on the computer frantically, we're eating, overeating in ways that hurt our bodies. I certainly own up to that one. Drinking, drug use, rage, outbursts of rage, reckless driving, escapism, uh, parked on the couch, growling at the kids when you want to watch 20 hours of Netflix uninterrupted. Those are all totally typical kinds of behaviors, but they often come, I think, because we cannot go into the place of the broken heart. We're too frightened and we've been taught in some way that it's like not healthy. Oh, don't go in there. Think good thoughts. Good, think good thoughts. Well, I don't want to think good thoughts when California's burning. I want to think about California burning and care about it and be real with it. Because pushing that away is not, it's not going to do any good for anybody. I have to feel my grief because only then can love get in. 
The third uh, stop, if you will, the third aspect of the heart path that Margaret Bullet Jonas articulates is the radiant heart. So you have the awakened heart, you have the broken heart, and then you have your radiant heart. When you live out of that place, you can, it, it comes out from you. And that's the only place from where we get our strength to act. That's what we're always trying to do, right? Whether it's bringing something to a neighbor or just paying attention, our actions come from that radiant heart. Um, I've lost my way here, okay. We, um, our actions spring from wisdom, from having been touched by that love that we've accessed through our awakened heart, by the mercy that we've accessed, by being deep in our broken heart. And we can then participate in the world and find something to live for and something perhaps big enough to die for, says Margaret. We tap into then potentially a wellspring of joy because all we have is to live for, uh, all we have to live for is this reality. This is the one we get. This is the time we get. This is the people we get. It's amazing. And so that's her three, oh, my three, her threefold path for the heart, which I wanted to focus mostly on. And then I will tell you very quickly her recommendations for congregational life. Okay, so you've had the spiritual guidance of the heart path. And now we have walk, a marching orders for congregational life. And I will just very briefly, number one, address helplessness. Just be real about it just like I'm being right here with you. Address helplessness by gathering for worship, seeing each other's faces, holding each other's hands. Number two, she says, offer rituals and practices of prayer and meditation that transform minds and hearts and set us on a good path. Spiritual practice, being together, worship is chief among those for us. So call the friends you haven't seen for a while, especially those who may be hiding and sucking their thumb a little bit, which I know I certainly would be tempted to do if I wasn't, um, you know, if it wasn't my responsibility to be here with you every Sunday, I might be, you know, oh. Get together in worship. Um, make up new forms of worship. Go outside, sing to the trees. Say, people accuse us of being tree huggers to begin with. Let's go hug some trees, you know. Provide moral leadership. And that's something that um, we can do through our ministry team work, through those who are interested in doing in the work of um, environmental justice and speaking about the fact that the climate crisis disproportionately affects um, you know, people who are poverty stricken, people who are in struggling communities, people who do not have a voice and enough power in government. So we, um, that's part of what we're called to do she says also, inspire bold action. Install solar panels, put in bike racks, replace lawns with community gardens, and so on. Um, an adequate response to the scope and speed of the climate crisis requires collective action and political engagement. So, We have another call, another charge, the path of the heart to remain awakened, to remain the vulnerable in our brokenheartedness, and to radiate our open-heartedness out into the world through action. We, we worship, we make moral statements, we work for climate uh, activism and on behalf of the planet, as our faith tradition calls us to do, and we remain grateful to each other, finally. Um, even if success is not assured, again, that what we do and what we live for is meaningful, that we are precious, that this time and this moment is precious, 
and that there is a power of love that abides within us and around us that nothing can destroy. Take it to heart. <laughs>